Hi, this is Coach Joe, laxplaybook.com, and did my next part of my new series where I'm calling Coach Talk, where I talk to coaches around the country about great ideas they contribute. And today I am with my friend Jimmy Oliver. Jimmy, how's it going? Outstanding. Thanks for having me. Jimmy, give us a little background on you. Um, I grew up on Long Island, went to Ward Melville, uh, played collegiately in Philly, and spent the next 15 years coaching in Philly. Uh, was lucky enough to coach at Episcopal Academy in Malvern Prep and decided to make the move to Florida. And I've been at Ponte Vedra since this is my seventh year at Ponte Vedra helping out. Um, but it's a great place to be. The school is fantastic. They, they're really behind lacrosse, which is not something you always hear in the South. And it's, uh, it's a wonderful place to be. Let me give you the more important fact about you, the most important fact, if you don't mind. Shit. The most important fact about Jimmy Oliver is I've made many friends by doing this website, laxplaybook.com, on the Facebook page, but you were actually my first friend I met through this site. So, I think I found your site before it was even live. You before, before well, it was live, but it was basically nothing but a few pages. I had probably 100 followers on my Facebook page. Now I'm pushing 15,000 as of 2015. So it's big and you've been with me from the very beginning. And so it's really cool that we get to talk about your plans now. And you were actually interviewed when I did the old podcast and now we got this yeah. a little more refined and it's a little better. I'm excited moving forward with this new plan. Uh, so we could interview coaches, talk to them about their ideas. And I just wanted to bring to light how much I appreciate you were the first guy who called me up and said, Hey, this is a good idea. I like it. You should keep doing it. Because this obviously isn't my regular job, so those words of encouragement really mean a lot to me. And you were the first one to kind of give me that push. So I want everyone well, to know I, that. When I found you, I, I was working for a, a, a lacrosse website company, so I really appreciated um, solid lacrosse websites. And this that was really one of them. I really enjoyed it, and I still did. Right. And what really grew out of it was the banter on the Facebook page. That's been the biggest uh, surprise success from doing this, is how many yep. people are on the Facebook page, which is why I'm doing this. As you spoke of before, let's hope this doesn't too, turn too much into a Wayne's World type feel. <laughs> that was a great movie. It was a great movie. Okay, so what we are talking about today, what Jimmy called me and he was like, you know what I'd really like to do? I was like, what's that? Because I love X to O's. And he was like, Joe, before we do X to O's, let's do practice plans. It all starts with practice plans. I grunted at you because I love doing X to O's. I think X to O's are so much fun, but you really reined me back and you were like, X to O's are great, but the core of everything is how you plan out a practice, correct? Yeah, I really, I'm really a firm believer in, in scheduling a practice that will make you better because that's the only point of practice is to get better. So before we start, and I want to do this with all the coaches I do this with, is first let's establish who we're talking about here. So we're talking about for you what this plan you've executed is basically a, I would call a fairly elite high school team, correct? Yeah, I'd say we're competitive in most regions. So would this plan we're going to talk about today, would it apply to a youth team like a U9, U11, or a travel team? Because when I'm setting up the image here, I'm setting up an image of a high school team that meets every day and plays at a fairly competitive level. So you may not use this if you're only meeting once a week or twice a week, or would you? Well, I would I would use this because anytime I've coached uh, youth or travel or whatever it is, I've always put together a very similar plan. It may not be the, the length. Um, of time, but for the most part, it's pretty similar. I may, you know, instead of having, uh, you know, 10, 11, 12 parts, I may only have five, six, seven parts. So what you're saying is this may modify the type of team you coach, which I would consider, as we said, an elite high school level team, but you could modify yeah. it as long as you maintain the principles of what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, I would think so. Okay, so let's get it started. So you gave we're going to start with a sample program that you um get, excuse me a sample practice plan that you drew up. So let's talk mm -hmm. about this. Talk me through it. So what are we looking at here? This one is from the 2015 season. It's our eighth practice, and I put the eighth practice because you're really into your second week by now, and you you not doing you've gotten all the administrative stuff out of the way. Practice is starting to flow. Um, so this is a this was a good plan to use. I thought. So obviously we want to stretch the beginning. Uh, if it takes more than 15 minutes, I usually get bothered because I can't stand being off schedule. 
Um, you have only so much time with the kids, and you got to make every minute count. Especially when they're not stretching uh, correctly or doing what you want them to do correctly. It drives you nuts. Because yeah. I get kids all the time. They're stretching, and then they're like, Coach, we need more time. Whether it's dynamic stretch, status stretch, whatever you choose to do as a coach. They're not doing it properly, and they say they want more time. They get off schedule. It drives me up the wall. And then I tell them, yeah. let's just get practicing. They get mad at me for not stretching. It's a whole thing. So I know what you mean. And something you'll notice in this plan is there's no water break. Okay. That's because with our guys, we tell them, when you want water, go get it. You don't have you to have ask. the water thirsty, bottles at it. each drill? No, but we're in a pretty confined spot, so it's not like they have to go very far to get water. Okay, so that's one thing. Is I agree with you totally on that. I think it's very archaic um, to do that old school halfway through the practice. Everybody stop for water. Kids go, chuk, 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 you know, walk all the way there. They come back. It's like this whole drama. And to get them back into it, it's another 10 minutes. So – one of the things I like to do on that point, because I don't not in a confined space, I'm in a very wide space, I tell them to bring water bottles and have it by each drill. So when they're out of the drill, they take a quick sip and they're ready to jump back in. We, we've tried going with water bottles, but they never last. They always get lost no. within day. Uh, so we tell them, when you're thirsty, go get water. You don't have to ask. You know, Obviously, if you're in the middle of a drill or we're going six on six and you leave to go get water, that's probably not beneficial. But... If you're standing on the sideline or you're in line to do a drill and you need to get water, go get it. Got it. Okay, so we got no water breaks here. No, and then you'll notice how these numbers, they skip back and forth uh, based on what, what section of practice it is. So not everything is lined up according to time. So what I do is I break it up by numbers and then within those numbers are the portions of practice. So number one is stretch. Number two is is numbers. And most people are familiar with numbers, but it's you stick offense on uh, at the midfield and the defense at, in the alley, and you call out six and six offensive guys go and five defensive guys go. And we use that sometimes just to get going, just to uh, build some competitiveness. Okay, so you have your stretching. So you do a basically a 10-minute drill that just really gets their blood going. And you don't do stick work at that time, which is interesting. So a lot of people do stick work after the stretch. Just go right into basically whatever they want to do, like a, you know, a line drill or you know, the meatloaf drill or Hogan drill or some form of a stick work drill. You go right into a getting going, let's get playing, let's get sweating type drill. Yeah, and it's not because we don't believe in stick work. We, you know, later in the practice, you'll see we spend a tremendous amount of time on it. Uh, but at this part of the season, we want to get competitive. Normally, okay. if you go four weeks into the season, you're not going to see probably two competitive things back-to-back. -back. But for the purpose of, of this practice, we went right into numbers, and then after that, we did a scramble, which is basically what well, we use it for situational. So everybody gets split into two teams. Uh, you know, the ones go here, the twos go there, and they'll start with a face off. And then I have a bucket of balls. And what I do is every 30 seconds or so, if the play's not moving, I blow it dead. I put a ball someplace else, and I say, "All right, black team's up by one with two minutes left to go in the first half." Or white team, you're down three with four minutes to go in the, in the fourth. And we give them situations but it's constantly moving. We never let the ball stand. So as soon as the ball stops moving or progressing, I just blow it dead and we put a ball someplace else on the field and we got to play it from there. Okay. So, and just to summarize what I'm looking at here is from, you have eight to eight fifteen. So eight fifteen mm -hmm. to basically eight forty. So we're looking at what's that? 25 minutes, essentially mm -hmm. you have mm -hmm. high energy, active competitive drills where they're just playing. Yep. And what's also great about that is, especially for teams that practice right after school, kids want to play. I mean, if they enjoy playing lacrosse and they love playing lacrosse, they want to actually play. And drills like this don't have to do with running plays or structures. These type of drills are very oriented around, here's a ball, do what you love, let's go. Get at it, move the ball around, get some goals, play some defense, and just enjoy playing. So it's yeah, a lot of fun. We, we may not spend a lot of time coaching during scramble either. We may let them try and figure it out on their own. 
Okay. Even if, because their only way they're going to learn is if they make mistakes. And it's okay. That's we, one of our, our big things is it's okay to make mistakes in practice. We right, want, especially okay. during this time because it looks like your goal during this time is more activity and sweating and getting out and playing. Yep, just like, playing. Yeah, this first 25 minutes is not really the time where you're spending a lot of time on technique and instruction. It's more, come on, guys, let's go, let's go, let's go. Now, now, now probably two weeks after this, we'll spend that third part doing our, our technique and stuff instead of scramble. We'll build the scramble or full field situational stuff later in the practice. But for, for this situation, the group of kids that we had, we thought this would be the best way to go at this for the eighth practice. Got it. Okay, so what do we have next? So we go to, we go to individuals, we call it. Basically, that's uh, skill work and stick work. So offense uh, will do their stick work. They'll do their shooting. They'll work on, you know, uh, time and room. They'll work on sweeps. They'll whatever they want to do, whatever the offensive coaches feel like they need to do. Defense, for the pr- most part, will do stick work, and then they'll go right into footwork. And that gets done every day. And so Some this form- we're talking more technicalities, coaching, you know, get your yes. elbow up, do this, drop step, you know, your positioning. Yeah. Now you're working on a little more technique. And this point, yeah. as I'm creating this image in my head, they've been running for 25 minutes, which also, which a lot of coaches learn in the coaching while, it's easier to get them to listen when they're a little bit tired. When their energy uh-huh. right after school and they want to go, they don't always want to listen that well. They just want to run. But now you got them having played for 25 minutes, so it may be easier to teach them a little more technique, correct? Yeah, and, and again, it was for this, every group is different. And I'll go through that when we move on to the next thing. But every group is different, and this group needed to compete right away. They needed to they needed to go head to head right away in order to get invested in practice. And not every group is that way. Some groups you can just say, "All right, we're going to go scrimmage in 25 minutes," and they'll do what they need to do. And in 25 minutes, they're ready to go. This group needed to do competitive stuff right away, and that's okay because everybody's every group's going to be different. I love that you said uh, that because in the last video I did, um, Coach Jeremy Duran brought up the point that not all things apply to all people. And you have to be flexible. And we've spoken a lot for over a few years now, how much it drives me absolutely nuts when coaches talk in these absolutes. Like, no, that's not the way you do it. This is the way you do it. That video doesn't work. This does. That offense doesn't work. This does. And you just made the point, even within your own team and your own system, you don't work in absolutes. You say, this applies for this. I'll apply for that. This team can run set plays. This team can't. This team works for this. This team doesn't. So I really like that you made that point, that you have to adapt it to your situation. My favorite phrase, and I don't don't know who made this up. I'm sure it wasn't me, but high school athletics, you never know what you're going to get. Yeah. On a day-to-day basis, you never know what's going to happen. Somebody broke up with their girlfriend. This one's got to take a test. This one got detention. This one, you know, um, is sick. So you just never know what you get. You have to be able to adapt, especially in high school across the college. You're getting paid to win, so it's my way or the highway. In high school, can't really be that way anymore. I don't think you can. Um, I used to think you could, but as I've gotten older, uh, I don't. I don't subscribe to that theory anymore. We've and I grew up playing for a guy who was it's my way or the highway, and that worked for us then. That was. 25 years ago. Now that doesn't work. So you've got to you've got to be able to adapt and, and mold around to the different type of kids that you have. Yep, I agree. Okay, so you got that stick work done. So you're at level four here. So, yep, so we're stick work. Work, shooting. You know, we're working defense. We're going to clearing drills, uh, ground balls into clear, whatever it is, whatever stick work you feel like doing. Offense is put – and then we go to Section 5. Offense will be doing – you know, they'll be going over whatever. The, you know, they're, they're 2 2 2 offense. They're just running dummy stuff just to learn it. And the defense is probably doing more footwork <laughs> at this point. Uh, we spend a tremendous amount of time doing footwork in our defense because high school defense is about only a couple of things. Your hand is in feet and a second slide. If your hands and feet are in the right spot, you're halfway there. And you're probably a lot further along than most teams. So we spend a lot of time on that stuff. 
Yeah, and maybe we'll do another conversation where we go through some of those drills another time. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got, what's that, uh, another 25 minutes built in of nothing but individual technique stuff. And so it's interesting now, they're not in contact with each other, the players. They're not you know, hitting each other right. or, or competing against each other. They did that in that first 25 minutes. Right. So now you're going from, if I'm looking at this correctly, 8.40 to 9.10. So now we're talking yep. 30 minutes. Jesus, when do you minutes. practice? Is this, is this 8.40 p.m. at night? Yeah, we, we have limited field space, so we had to make do with what we had. So we went, we went um, eight to ten usually. Wow. Our kids go to school a little bit later in the day. They they don't class doesn't start till nine fifteen. So we're a little fortunate, but we're unfortunate in the fact that we have very little space because yeah. during the beginning of the spring season, in Florida is a winter sport, so it overlaps with lacrosse. So you got, got and to their credit, boys and girls soccer always go far at our school. So they're still practicing as we begin practice. And then we've got boys and girls across, so that's another four teams. So we've got six, possibly eight teams going at the same time. We really only have two fields to practice right. on. Um, so we had, we had to bring in lights, and it worked out really well for us last year. Good for you. So 10 at night. Ugh. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not doing that. <laughs> okay, so we got the – where are we on this thing? So we got 840 to 910, so you have the defense. Okay, yeah. now we're at number six. Now we go back we, – we do stuff where normally this would be um, earlier in practice, later in, later in the season. But we split up into however many coaches we had that night. If we have five, then we'll split up into five ground ball stations. And we'll do everything from just your basic one-on-one -on -one, to a drill where there's a loose ball in a crease and offense picks it up, they've got to move it and score. If defense picks it up, they got to clear. Whatever situation you want to come up with. Okay. So we'll spend, we'll spend 15 minutes doing that. Right, and I have a great drill for that on the, my page. You did a two plus two, add one, where the two guys go mm -hmm. against each other, and then the team that wins, they add one, so it turns into a three on two, and you get some nice transition. Um, but yep. we all have a ton of ground ball drills I mean, we could do. I mean, yeah. it's just it's just endless. And ground ball drills, in my opinion, you really want to be creative with it. Yep. I mean, I don't you know. You can't do the one on one and leave it at that because it's unrealistic. And you don't do the lay on the ground without looking at me, blow the whistle, and run, go get it drill. I do that, but it's a two on one. Okay. Where we've got three lines. The guy in the middle is on his own. The two guys on the outside are working together, and I'll if, if I. I only put the ball no more than five yards because you're not running 30 yards. How much does it drive you nuts when you see a new coach launch the ball and make them run like a puppy fetching a duck? I mean, it's just um, I mean, nuts when they do I think that everybody's got to learn the hard way. <laughs> Talk about a quick way to lose balls. Do ground ball drills by launching the ball 30 yards away. Yep. Yeah. Um, so we do that kind of stuff. But, you know, it's also that drill in particular with the line on the ground – the kids kind of have some fun with it because they think they can cheat and, you know, they have fun with it. So um, we don't always do it, but we do it sometimes. Yeah. Okay, so we got our ground ball stations. You're doing your yep. thing. Okay, what's next? Right away we go into what we call one-on-one -on -one into four-on-four -four buildup. Got it. We run a, a – our base offense is basically a, similar to that Princeton pairs offense. Uh-huh. Um, we call it Princeton, and we have – How creative of you. So this drill really helps offensively uh, hammer home the concepts. It'll We'll put it in a diamond. We'll have a line at the midfield, line in each alley, and a line at X, and each line has offense and defense. And one line will start with the ball, and they'll play one-on-one. -on -one, and as soon as that plays over, those two guys stay, and then we go into two-on-two and then three on three, and then four on four. Got it. So it builds up into that four on four, and it really works well hammering home the principles of the, of the Princeton offense that we run. Which segues really nicely into this next thing, there's six on six. Six on six, yep. We Which I've never, I, I'll be honest with you, it's probably my least favorite time of practice, but it's necessary. Yeah. It's a necessary, but you have to do it. And... If we've got the right amount of numbers, we'll do it at two ends. 
depending on the, the type of time of year, we'll do ones versus twos or we'll do ones versus ones. Uh, but we'll do six on six and we try to get everybody involved in six on six. We try to run through everybody as best we can. Uh, there's no point in having a kid practice if he's not practicing, if he's just standing there the entire practice. Right, and this is one of the bigger challenges for teams. So yes. it's one of those things, I hear what you're saying, but it's easier said than done. Um, Correct. Us coaching in our 40s now, it's just, it's not that simple. I mean, I, I hear you, and I try and do the best I can, but it's also that feeling of, well, what's the point of teaching the back of guys if the first guys don't even know what they're doing? Correct. And in some regard, we're very fortunate that we've got some very good lacrosse players here, and that has a lot to do with our youth program and our travel programs before they come to high school. So we're able to maybe get some kids some backups a little more time than maybe they normally would someplace else. Uh, but it doesn't always happen. There are plenty of practices where, where you know, the number nine defenseman doesn't, doesn't get any real reps in a six-on-six. Six. Yeah, It's just the reality. So we'll spend 15 minutes doing that. If it's going well, we'll, we'll go more. But for the most part, we'll do it for 15 minutes. Uh, we usually end then with with extra man man down. That's just how we do it. I know some coaches like to start their practice with extra man man down because it's really that important, and I don't disagree with them. Uh, it's just how we tend to do it and how we like to do it and how it flows for us. So what are the kids doing who are not on the man up or man down team? Some of them are with another coach working on stick work, um, shooting, uh, they're, we're trying to get them to do other stuff, but there's a there's a handful of kids that could be on extra man or man down that are there that may not get the reps, but they need to know what's going on because if Bobby goes down, then Johnny's got to go in. Right, but you're still only talking about a few extra kids. You still got a big portion of your team who's probably not going to be on the man up or man down. Correct. What do you got? So you've got six, eleven, twelve kids with a goalie. Um, and then you've got probably another three poles and another short stick, and then you've got another two middies and probably two attackmen floating around. So that's um, another five. So that's seven. That's that's two thirds of the team almost. Right. So the other thing. Yes. There aren't a whole lot of kids standing around, so they're they're doing something. Yeah. They're doing something. Got it. Uh, so we will we'll roll into extra man from there. Now. You'll, you'll see in the next next set of papers um, something we like to do at the end of most practices, uh, and I'll get into that later, um, which, again, the kids really enjoy doing. Uh, but at most practices, I will put – we will put a note down at the bottom of the plan what is our, our focus tonight, and it could be the same focus for three days in a row. But – we always want to pick up the ground ball the first time. That's what the focus of this practice was. We don't want to go to scoop it and miss it and then pick it up again and then miss it. We want to get it the first time as best we can. And we wanted to start every drill we could with a ground ball to signify how important ground balls were. So here's a question for you. Mm -hmm. One of the most annoying things with scheduling practice is to make time for the guys that are very vital, but they have specialty skills most notably face-off and goalie. We tend to do that before practice. So the face-off guy has to come a little earlier. Yeah, uh, face-off guys usually come 15 minutes early, and goalies usually come 20, 25 minutes early. Uh, they just need a little more time. It, it all depends on availability. It depends on field space. You know, face-off guys can work in a small group, but – if you have two goalies, you need two cages, and you need two guys to shoot on them. And it certainly isn't going to be me because they want somebody who can actually shoot, and I can't coach a goalie while I'm shooting. So we've got shooters for goalies. Right. For uh, me, the face-off position has always been tricky because I acknowledge their value, but especially when you're in programs where you don't have a face-off specialist. That kid's also your right. midi. He could also be your man-up guy. He could be your defenseman. Yeah. You know, it's – and, and and you could argue it for the man up, but you can't really argue every single guy needs to be working on face-offs on your whole team. Nope, every single guy shouldn't be working on face-offs. And right, so that's what I mean. So there's time for that isolated guy that you have to work on him or whatever, a small handful of guys, and it can be extra difficult when that guy is also, like I said, 
he does the clears for you. He does the right. line up. And on the lower level teams, your face off guy is probably one of your more experienced players. Correct. Correct. It's the and upper level teams where one of your better players is not the face off guy. But if in the lower level, your kid knows how to do a face off really well. Chances are he's been around the sport a decent amount of time, and he's probably one of your more skilled players as well. Right. Um, and so we've got we've got our, our man down committee has a working knowledge of face offs. We call it because he's not a face off guy, but he's our best short stick man down guy. So if the face off guy Let's say we've got to take a man down face off. Well, if I've got a Fogo, I don't want to take him. I don't want to take a man down face off. I'd rather lose the face off and have my short stick D midi out there on man down than my Fogo, who it's like peas on a knife, but is great at face offs. And if he loses it, we're really playing six on four. So that's a great idea. And it just seems so obvious, but a lot of people don't think about that. When you think about who plays where as you set up your team, I love that idea of making your man down short stick also be your face off guy. Yeah, and, and our guy has a working knowledge of face offs. He can take a face off. He's more than likely only going to win 10, 20% of the time. Uh, but that's okay because as long as we like to say, make it a loose ball, just make it a loose ball and we'll figure it out. Uh, if we make it a loose ball, we've got a chance to come up with it. If we give up a fast break, we're, we're dead in the water. So we try to make it a, a, a 50-50 ball out of that. And it's okay if he loses it. As long as it's not a fast break, we're fine because we're pretty confident in our man down guys. And we are very confident in our short stick man down guy. He is, without a doubt, the best. I think he's the best in Florida. So I'd much rather have him out there than most other guys. Right. Okay, so do you want to move on to the other information yeah, you set yeah. up? Okay, yep. get to that. Look at that sweet logo, the Muscle Shark. Did you design that? No, I wish I had. Okay, so I assume we don't want to see this. You want to go to page two? Yes. Okay, here we go. So how do you, how do you know what to schedule in practice? How do you know when to put what in? And – Knowing what you need to have in is going to determine what gets done when. If you've got an experienced team coming back, we've got a fairly experienced defense team coming back. So chances are we're not going to spend a lot of time doing Shark or Hopkins. We're going to, we'll are gonna go over it again, and we'll make sure everybody knows it, but we're not going to spend a lot of time teaching it because everybody knows it already. Offensively, we've got some young guys – on offense this year, we're gonna to have to spend more time teaching Princeton and whatever you know the one four one we use and, and this play and that play. We're gonna to to spend spend some time doing that, and that determines when things get put in and how much time you need to spend on those. Right. So we yeah we can move on to the next slide. Okay, next slide. So how many practice days are until the first game? So let's say we start practice in the middle of January, and our first game is sometime early February. So we've got three weeks, 17 days of practice if we don't get rained out. In the north, if you don't get snowed out, you don't have gym time. So we've got seven days of practice, 17 days, and we want to we want to build backwards, knowing that we're not going to get everything in for the first game. And if you try to get everything for the first game, you're going to get nothing in for your first game. There's no way you can have you should have everything in. So if Pick you're your comfortable, battles, having, jack of all's expert of none. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah, pretty much. Um, you know, you don't need five extra man sets or plays for the first game. It's just not going to be. It's not feasible. You're not going to have it down cold. You don't need to have. You know, maybe you don't have your zone in for the first two weeks of games. That's okay, and you're just playing man to man. If it works, if it doesn't work, you've got to work on getting better. But if you put everything in, it's just not, it's not, they're not going to know anything. So you try to understand that you don't need everything in for that first game and that kids are going to be different. Um, some kids need more time to learn different things. So if you've got a new kid at X on offense and you know he's going to be good, but he's young and he needs to learn. You're going to have to spend more time working the ball for Max. 
and you're just going to have to understand that. And you're going to have to understand that they're not your expectations are only setting yourself up for failure. You've got to be have a clean slate with the kids. Otherwise, they're never going to be successful. Got it. All right. So we'll go to the next slide. Yeah. Okay. So we broke this down into three weeks. What do we need to do? What do we need to have in? So week one, we want to have the basics of um, first step and and a recovery for our defense. We want to have the basic concepts of a one four one. Obviously, we want our clears in, uh, our basic clear. We want to make sure we understand where we're going on a fast break and a slow break. Uh, and each week, we're obviously working on extra man, man down, and face offs. Week two, we're going to implement another offense. Um, we're going to make sure we understand the second slide and the backside help. We'll begin work on a zone, and that's all it is. Is really just begin work on it because zones, especially, take a long time to really play well. Um, we want to work on our clears. We'll have a secondary clear in. We run a sideline clear when the ball's dead above the uh, restraining line. Uh, again, extra man, man down face-offs. And then the third week, we want to re make sure we review a couple of things that we know that we're comfortable going into that first game with. Clears have to be down pat. There's nothing you can't you can do about that. You have to have them down pat. And you got to make sure kids understand your basic offense and your basic defense. Yeah. Okay, so that's the first three weeks. And now you got your daily schedule here. Yeah. I, the, the plan I showed you didn't flow as well as I normally have it flow, but, again, that was just based on the team. Um, you want to make it flow, and from what I understand, it's as you're writing a paper for college. Not that I wrote many of them, but if you, you paper wants to flow, you want to have a beginning, of, you know, a, an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. Uh, so each segment should really touch the next segment in some capacity. This will help you reinforce ideas and reinforce philosophies. Um, if you're looking for a drill just to do a drill, there's no point in being there. You have to understand that, well, we look at it this way. We're not trying to win every game. Teams that try to win every game, they may win every game in the regular season. They don't end up going very far in the playoffs. We're okay with playing poorly in the beginning of the year as long as we're playing really well at the end of the year. How so, very John Donowski of you. Yeah. It's just it doesn't it doesn't serve a purpose to try and win every game. It really doesn't. If I get better in the first quarter from the last fourth quarter and I get better in the second quarter from the first quarter and so on and so on, winning will take care of itself. It really will. And what drills are going to do that to make you better? Line drills are not going to do it. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm a firm believer that line drills are just a waste of space and a waste of time. So we never do line drills, ever. Got we it. also never just do your basic. The defense never does just a basic go get a ground ball and throw it. It's a roll it, kick it, goose it, scoop it, throw it. You know, reinforces several ideas, creating space. It also makes more so, makes things more interesting for the kids too. Yeah, and actually, it's funny. Some uh, at one point last year, defense does a lot of we roll the ball, we kick the ball, we goose the ball, we scoop the ball, and then we curl and throw it. Each one creating space. <coughs> Excuse me. And at one point during the year, some kid goosed the ball, and he's like, "Hey, that drill actually works." I said, yeah, it does. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Even though they've been doing it the whole time in the game, they just don't know they're doing it. But it's funny when they say, hey, it really works. Yeah. Oh, and you're not like, just a hat rack. Yeah, thanks for the credit, man. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> if you're doing new, newer drills or drills that really need some explanation, have them, have them printed out with you as on the back of your practice plan or on a separate sheet of paper, or on a dry erase board, have it mapped out so that everybody understands it. And you got to make sure your coaches understand it before going to practice, because if they don't understand it, the kids don't understand it. 
and there's nothing worse than a drill that doesn't work because people don't understand. Yeah, no, it's just awkward, confusing, and frustrating for everybody. Very much so. Yeah, all right. Okay. So this is the plan from 2012. And you can see we did pre-practice. It was face-offs and goalies for 20 minutes before practice. And then at this point, we were calling them quarters instead of instead of periods. Uh, it happened to be one of our kids' birthday that day, so we sang happy birthday. So uh, what is this, preschool? Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 you know what? It's the goofy stuff like that that the kids remember. I know. I'm just messing with you. And, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so this was another format we used. Uh, and this one kind of flows a little bit differently. Um, so we would do – we take 20 minutes individual time as opposed to the 30 minutes we did before. And then we'd roll into an, some sort of unsettled. Um, and then we'd break up an offense, defense, and then we'd go, again, six on six, and we try to go both ends, and then we'd do some unsettled in the fourth quarter there. It, you can break it up wherever you want. You can call it whatever you want. You know, obviously, we, we, we're not married to any particular format, uh, as you can see by two different plans. It's really what works best for your team. Um, I, I won't say what works best for you because if you do what's best for you, that may not be best for the kids in right. that they may learn that way that you want them to learn. Got it. All right. And then who has input into the, to, to the plan? It's It can't just be one person. you got to have input from multiple people. And the more people, the more sense of ownership they have. Um, I may want to put in or, or do a specific drill that, that I like to do. And, you know, I get... I get like everybody else. There's a drill I love that we do, and I would do it every day just because I love doing it. I think it's a great drill. But the other coaches will see that, yeah, you know what? Three days in a row of that drill is probably too many days. So let's move on to a different drill uh, that maybe has the same principles. And they, they'll see that, and you don't always see it. So that gives them it gives them a sense of ownership as well. Um, it can't just be one guy doing it. It really the, it can't be the, you know, this is not a democracy, it's a dictatorship philosophy. I, I think it should be, everybody should have a little more, um, I don't know if socialism is the right word for it, but um, everybody has some input. Well, and, you go back to the core of being enjoyable. Nobody wants yeah. to participate. I don't care what anybody says. There's a lot of great coaches out there who want to be good soldiers. Nobody likes being dictated what to do and never being heard. Correct. And you're going to find your help dwindling off real quick, you know, if you don't actually try and incorporate them. And if you don't think they have anything intelligent to say, then you probably shouldn't have them be coaching with you. True. You know, if, you, if you have them there, you have them there for a reason. Correct. And there are plenty of times where kids don't look like they're having fun. Something is very, very wrong. If they're not having fun, what is the point of being there? Right. It's – how, especially you with your Long Island Ward Melville background, how many times in your lifetime have you seen coaches where it's like, dude, you're missing the point here in a big way? Yeah, I mean, I, I can look back now, now that I'm older, and I, I see some coaches when I was younger, and even when I was younger, I totally missed the point. Totally missed the point. You know, it was the only goal is to win a state title. Well, guess what? That's not really the only goal. It maybe was when I was 25 or 30, but I'm, you know, going on 45, and it's not the goal anymore. My goal is I want to develop great relationships, and I want to be competitive. I want to learn. I want the kids to get better. But at the end of the day, I was telling you before, we had our alumni game today, and I got to see kids come back who, who graduated five years ago, and it was just fun to see them and listen to what they're doing with their lives and having them excited to tell you and kids who weren't there texting you to – say, you know, wish I was there. Um, there's more to it, you know, and if you're interested in learning more about that stuff, Joe Ehrman does a great job at, of, of spelling it out. Um, there's there's more to it. So, um, yes, and the I next section, obvious to people. Yeah. yeah, the next section talks about the players uh -huh. possibly having a whole scheduling practice. Uh, I haven't done that so much recently, 
as I did when I was younger, but I would give them a Wednesday. Wednesday, would, they would get X amount of time to practice what they wanted, what they felt was important, what they enjoyed doing. And, again, it gave the players a sense of ownership. Um, you know, obviously it wasn't a goof around time. It was, it was still practice. Um, but they felt more involved in what was happening. And every now and then I still do it. You know, I'll do it on a – when I was younger, I did it every Wednesday. Now I, I do it every, you know, a couple of days during the year um, when we know we've got maybe two or three days before a game. So we'll give them that – let's say we play on a Thursday and it's a Monday. We'll give them a Monday portion of the practice and say, all right, what do you want to do? Interesting. And we'll have it mapped out before practice. And that's also great for that kid who thinks he knows everything. Yep. It's like, okay, yeah. you think everything's doing wrong? Here, here's your time to do it. Rock out. And it works out well most times um, because if it's just, all right, we're going to play kickball. No, we're not going to play kickball. Um, it's got to be relevant. And yeah. most of the times when you ask, ask your captains or your seniors to do that, they're pretty pretty much on the ball. They know what, they know what needs to happen. Right, so it actually works out pretty well. Yeah, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's fun. Yeah. What are you going to do? <laughs> there are plenty of things of what are you going to do when. Um, when it rains here and you get canceled, it's because it's pouring. Um, none of our our county, none of our county schools have turf. Everybody's grass here in the county. So when it rains, what are we going to do? Well, we're not going in the gym. It's, we're not allowed to, to be in the gym playing lacrosse. It's just not going to happen. Um, when I was up north at Malvern, when it snowed, we went to the gym. That was just how it was, but that's right. not the way it is here. So we'll go in and we'll do film work, or we'll do chalkboard, and we'll make sure everybody understands what we're doing. We'll just draw it out. But you need to have a plan of what you're going to do when weather happens, because it's going to happen. Right. And kids get sick and you have grade problems and just injuries and weather and field situations and you have to have backup plans. So I totally get that. Yep. And if you ever want a lesson in how to adjust, I really recommend people come with me to Colombia and help me when I'm doing South America, just work on that little plug there, Central America, <laughs> excuse me. Um, but one thing I learned, if you're a grower of the game, a lot of people listening have played for you, uh, well, coach established programs. But people who are a grower of the games, whether you're like me who travel to different countries or you're people who start lacrosse in Brooklyn or Oakland, a lot of people doing great work there, they know this tenfold. And people talk about utilizing the expertise of elite coaches. Well, sometimes those coaches on the lower levels who coach at the Oakland Lacrosse Club or in Brooklyn or the great work they're doing in Denver, that nonprofit over there, they know about what you're talking about right here, how to adjust better than anybody else. So if you mm -hmm. bring out one of those coaches and you say, it's raining, what do we do? They'll be like, I'll tell you what to do. You know, they'll have like 20 things listed. You know, this is a piece of cake um, because they're used to having to adjust, having no space, no field, no nothing, and be able to make it work. When I was, when I was younger and I was a head coach at Archbishop Carroll in Philly, we didn't go inside. I didn't care what the weather was. If it snowed and we were able to get on the field, we got on the field. If it rained – and we were able to go outside. We went outside. I didn't believe in going inside at that point. Um, and now, obviously, when the AD says you can't practice, guess what? You can't practice. It's just the way it is. Yeah. So you've got to adjust, and if you want to adjust, you got to be able to adjust weekly. You know, stuff happens. You know, this player broke up with his girlfriend, and this one got sick, and this one is in detention for stupid stuff, and the team may not be moving as long as you had planned it would. So you've got to take some steps backwards. Um, you've got to be able to adjust your plan. And then everybody's had this happen. There's sometimes just the drill sucks. Like it's just not working. You've got to move on. You can't, you can't force the drill down their throat if it's not working. For whatever reason, they didn't explain it well. They don't understand it. You know, they're in brain lock and they just don't get it. Or, um, I know Whatever. what you mean. You get that gut feeling. Things are happening, and you're like, this Ugh. just doesn't feel right. That that old uh, feel test. One more minute. Move on. Yeah. So okay. you're gonna have you're gonna have some extra time built in. So do something different. Right. Or just move on to the next section. Um, and one thing I, I 
probably would have put in there if I remembered is that what we do probably four out of six days a week is we end practice with star drill. And we do it with multiple balls. And for every ball they drop, it's a sprint. And what we usually do is we give them the choice. We go double or nothing. If they get a trivia question right, they don't have to do the sprints. If they don't, they've got double the amount. They always take the trivia. Always. Yeah, which makes more and, fun. And since we're in our fees, most of the coaches here, we always shoot them with an 80s question or a Star Wars question. Something that they might be able to know, but chances are they don't. It's, you always get that one kid who knows everything about trivia questions and always gets it right. And two years ago, we had that. <laughs> and he just knocked it cold every time. If it was a sports question, forget it. He was getting it. It didn't matter. Um, so it's fun. The kid, you know, when they get it right, the kids go nuts, and they have a great time. It's a great way to end practice. I like it. I'm going to do use that next time. So with that being said, we've been talking for a while, and you know, you offered a lot of great stuff. And I want to thank you for taking the time to show me all this. Is there anything else you want to add before we wrap it up? Um, I don't think so. I maybe you know, just make sure you're enjoying practice as much as the kids are, because if you're not enjoying it, what's the point of being there? Have fun with you know, it. Everybody's yeah. got that kid who seems like he's not enjoying himself. And you just got to remind him it's a game. Games are meant to be fun. It's just like Monopoly. Yes. You, why, you don't like playing Monopoly. Why would you play it? Don't do it. Yeah, so I love everything you offered, everything you put together. And everybody who's listening, you know, this doesn't always have to work for you. This is something Jimmy took the time to present and offer what works for him. Feel the need to adjust it. But like I always said, there are no absolutes. So just use it as a template or even disagree with it and come up with something better. If you want to share it, let me know. And last but not least, if any of you guys are interested in learning more about what I do in Colombia, I would love to share that with you because I'm very passionate about growing the game, especially in that part of the world, in addition to coaching my local high school team and doing what I do here. So if any questions about that, let me know. So with that being said, thank you very much, Jimmy, for taking the time. I appreciate you having me. This is great. I love your site and keep doing what you're doing. And this is Joe from laxplaybook.com, and I'll talk to everybody later.